Today is Tuesday, June 2nd, 2015, and we are here today to interview Sister Rita Valade. Um, our first question is, we would like to know about your journey of faith. What led you to the religious life? Um, you know, I think a lot of different dynamics all interplayed. And um, part of it was I did have sisters in grade school. And I saw um, them having a good time in life and giggling and getting down and shooting marbles with us as kids. And um, I, saw, I saw it as a very viable lifestyle, I think, without having that language back in the day. Um, and um, I did always have, a, um, I won't say a special relationship with God because everybody has access to the same, but a, a very intimate relationship with God from the time I was a very small child. I, I didn't understand in grade school why kids were struggling with what prayer is. It's just, you just talk like your best friend, you know, you just say, well, what the heck is that all about? Or I, I remember when I was young, Jesus was young with me, when I got to be a teenager, uh, I kind of switched to Mary because she got the woman thing, <laughs> the female thing, <laughs> and then and then they moved into timelessness. So, um, it, so it's a it's a synergy. Um, um, I a, and I've always been a person that has you know wanted to be of service, whatever that looked like, and um, and um, so that all combined. Um, and I was, you know, back in 1974 when I entered, nobody entered anymore. So, I mean, I was one of the last of the en um, masse groups. Um, so there were a few people that entered with me, but uh, they left shortly. And um, How old were you when you entered? I was 21. Okay. Um, I uh, just felt pretty clear that this was what I wanted to do. I. Uh, went to Mercy High in Farmington Hills, and then I um, uh, went to University of Michigan Dearborn campus, because I couldn't afford anywhere else, and I wanted to get out of the Catholic thing. I just, too much Catholic, you know. I wanted to see what it was like at a public. And I also thought Michigan rocked, and I still do. <laughs> so, um, go blue. I'm go blue, that's right, that's right. So, um, and what I loved about the, the Dearborn campus was at the time we had classes in trailers. Um, that was not built up. There were one or two buildings, but um, and the way that they got professors there was they enticed Ann Arbor folks to say you can come and teach whoever you want and whatever whatever curriculum you want in small classes, and that was I know I've I, from being on the other end now incredibly enticing because you keep your same salary but you have a whole different. Um, educational experience and so that's what I had I remember I had these out-of-the-box courses on, on Marxism and uh, spiritual Marxism and spirituality you know I mean things people professors could do a lot of different things and so I really uh, loved that uh, so all those things kind of combined and I I, I just hungered for more why did you choose Sisters of Mercy over uh, another religious group? Well, you know, it would seem like it would be an automatic shoe in because I'd had Mercy's Sisters of Mercy in grade school, Sisters of Mercy in high school. Oh, right. But in college, I wanted to have it made it make an informed choice. And <laughs> in fact, one time I remember coming out of surgery. I'd had gallbladder surgery in my early twenties, and I don't remember much of the recovery process. It was before the microsurgery. And when I finally kind of really woke up, the doctor said to me, Sister, I just want to ask you, did you go to Michigan? And I said, yes. And he said, okay, I just figured. And I said, why? And he said, you ask so many questions. You want to just know information, even if you don't understand it. So I had that attitude. And so I looked at a lot of different communities in college. Um, the Sisters of St. Joseph and the Sisters, the uh, Dominican Sisters. Um, and in particular in the IHM sisters. Uh, my mother had been an IHM for oh. six months in 1938. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing so, she laughed. Well, yes, it was. I think that, that was quite correct. That's yeah. right. That, I thought that was great courage. I have a story about that that's pretty anecdotal and cute. But 
Um, you can tell us. No? Sure. You can edit this? Sure. <laughs> so, this is about you. So, so, yes, but I don't need to, you know, uh, seem like I have wandering dementia. But, <laughs> but it's also it's also about what led you. That's right. It's part of the flavor. Yes. My sister, uh, the little anecdotal story, which I think is still pretty funny. Um, my, my oldest sister was 12 years older than I, is 12 years older than I, 11 and 12 years older. And um, she had just entered the Sisters of Mercy in 1961. She didn't stay, she left in 68. But at that point, um, I was in the first grade. So I was getting used to what the norm was about visiting Visitation Sunday and those terribly boring long days where we had to be dressed up and have no idea what to do with ourselves at the former Mercy College campus. I mean, so I was, you know, six years old, running around, seven years old, First Communion. So one time, it, the, the, my family, without Marianne, who was in the community, um, was traveling on a Sunday drive, and we um, were on Telegraph Road. I didn't know we were on Telegraph Road. Oh, gosh, I was six years old. You know, I, we were on one of these long, boring rides that my father used to love to do mm -hmm. on Sundays. And, um, and we were driving by this big piece of property, and I remember on the right there was this large building, and so what, you know, where's the ice cream that's where I want? And my mom said, this is, I don't know why it's so clear, but it was very momentous for me. She said, I used to live there. You see that building? I used to live there. We said, what? Yeah, you used to live there? What do you mean? You know, and she said, yeah, you know how Mary Ann entered the Sisters of Mercy? How she's a nun? I was too. What? You know, wow, wow, wow. You're my you mother. Know, kids, you're my mother. And I remember... I remember her arm was over the bench of the front seat, you know, and her hand often just rested on my dad's shoulder. It was always a nice thing. I, bucket seats don't allow that. But, you know, just, just that's usually how they traveled, her finger just on his shoulder. And I came up in between and laid into her arms and I said, You were a nun? I'm so glad you didn't stay because then we'd only be able to see you once a month and never during Lent. <laughs> <laughs> and I still remember the twinkle in my mother's eye looking at my dad saying, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a really cool it's, story. It's, I remember that. I can almost, you know, um, uh, I tried to explain to my mom once that I still can smell what how, what, how her arms smelled at that moment, you know. And she said, oh, no, you know, it's, no, 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 it's, it's, it was a beautiful, deep you smell, as I think only a child knows of their mother. I remember that. So um, I have, I think, you know, being raised in a family that was sensitive to different life choices and supportive of it. And, um, you know, I didn't, wasn't thinking about that then. I wasn't thinking about any kind. I never knew I was going to be a nun all my life or any of these stories that I've heard from some of my older my sisters in the community. Um, but when I when I got to college and I, I, I dated and I did, had fun and did silly, stupid things, um, I knew that there was something deeper for me. So I chose the Sisters of Mercy and I'll tell you what ultimately made the decision. I had just come from a weekend of, they called them come and see weekends or whatever with different communities. Um, and um, from the Adrian Dominican place down in Adrian, Michigan. And I, it was a wonderful experience and they have beautiful property there and the sisters were so warm and it was just, you know, the intellectual tradition of the Dominicans that was in, intriguing to me. And, and I had to stop, I had something uh, that I had to drop off at Mercy Center out in Farmington, 11 mile middle belt. And I walked in to this poured concrete, 1965, new, ultra new building at that point. Well, I mean, it was 10 years old, but I didn't know anybody there. There was nobody there that met me. But I remember walking in between those two double doors and just having this wash of feeling of, I'm home. Mm -hmm. And it's a powerful experience of grace. You know, I think my sister would say, how do you know? And I said, well, how do you know you wanted to marry John and not Jim, who you were dating? How do you know that? How do you put that into words? You know, Jim actually had a better job. He had better money. He was, you know, less complicated in a sense. But um, how do you know that? And she said, well, I don't know. You just know it. I said, yeah, that's it. You know, I, 
we, we can have tomes. We could fill this library with stories uh, and intellectual investigations as to why people make life choices. But so many times it just is un, it's, it's at the unspeakable level. Now you mentioned something early, uh, a little bit earlier and we've been hearing it from several of um, the people, we, the, the sisters that we've interviewed and it's the laughter and mirth in the community. Mm -hmm. And my mom once said to me, she said, she was a school secretary at St. Anselm's. And it was right when it was, I mean, the parish was built, was founded the year I was born. And she had been an executive secretary at Chrysler. And so she missed the working world. But she stayed home and she was a happy camper. But once that school, she was right there and helping out and volunteering. And it was just, you know, eight blocks away from us. And so I grew up as a little kid first thing I did was rearrange and uh, I was in charge of the library magazine racks on the bottom because I was like you know five and six years old I could organize those and um, I was I would walk around the school all day I could just toddle through and sit in an empty go into a classroom and sit in an empty desk and everybody you know the teachers the kids just tolerated me coming in I'd answer questions I'd ask questions it, 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 school education was such a fun experience for me um, and so my mom once said though she said I think honey if I had been in the mercies if I had known about the mercy she grew up on the east side which was the IHM territory in a sense and the west side was of Detroit was the mercy area not explicitly of course but she said if I had known of the mercy she said I probably would have stayed she said they just laugh. They read the paper. They know what's going on. They, they enjoy each other. Um, it's not a sternness. She said, I know they have rules, and they had rules that they had to follow, but I tell you, I think that they tried every creative way to get around those rules when it impacted negatively on others. So, like, nuns were not allowed to eat in anybody else's house in the early 60s before Vatican II. Even people that entered couldn't go back home to their families to eat with them. You know, bizarre. it was very strange. Very bizarre. But the Mercies would come walk. They they would walk down from the convent, the ten blocks to our house, and they would sit outside and eat. They weren't in the house. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so they would join us in a picnic or something. So it was like creative and and and. When I think about our history and when I think about the trouble we have gotten into with the hierarchical church at times and things, it's not to be, it's never to be in your face. It's been about what makes sense, what is, what's the human element here that we feel a need to address that supersedes some rigid rule that doesn't seem to apply here. So um, I, laughter is part of it. I mean having a good time and uh, Catherine McCauley is quoted our founders is quoted as saying once now I couldn't find it I did a master's thesis on her and I could never find that quote again I keep looking for it but the part of the legend is that we ought not disturb our relations with the distillers they've been very kind to us <laughs> <laughs> and um, and she would say you know laugh every dance every evening and um, she had an approach to authority that uh, there's a part of a limerick that I can't remember all of it, of course, is, but it starts like, don't let, don't let, and she would write this to her superiors in the houses in Ireland and to the novice director and stuff. Don't let, don't let crosses vex her tease. Try to meet all with peace and ease. Consider the faults of every day, but often in a joyful way. And when you seriously complain, let it be known to cause you pain. Um, uh, Attend to one thing at a time. At a time, you've 15 hours from six to nine. Um, do do what you can with a jest, and no, and with a jest, dismiss the rest. Uh, have patience always at your side. You'll want it for a constant guide. Uh, uh, that kind of thing. That's There's more. Amazing. You remember it all. Again. Yeah, I just love yeah, it because yes. it's 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 what we see as how authority is to be lived, and that was not. I mean, of course, there's been aberrations, but 
There was, uh, there used to be back in the day, a joke about. Of course, every community has, has their. I mean, there's a whole. I always said if I was going to get my doctorate, which I did, but I didn't do it on this. But um, uh, of the conversations about different communities, they would say the Dominicans. Now this is, you know, so not true. I'm just saying this is not true. <laughs> the Dominicans would study the problem think it through, engage other people in the process of learning how to best move that mountain. You know, and um, the, the, uh, I can't remember what other communities would do, but the mercies, what the mercies would do. Oh, and then another community would go ahead, study the mountain, learn how to do it, and then quietly in the night, the mountain is gone. And people just are, wow, you know, it really broke way for new ways of thinking or whatever, but quietly. And the story was that when the Mercy saw them out, they would gather their friends, throw a party, move the thing, and continue on. <laughs> <laughs> and and I love all those little traditions that we, I was raised in. Not I didn't know about it when I was a student. It's only when I became, I entered the community. You know, you just hear those stories. Or the stories of um, Sister Administrator down at Mount Carmel. Um, there were some very, very poor families that had come into their emergency room who had nowhere to go. And so she had, they had a couple extra rooms in the hospital and just housed them there for a few days until they could get another place to stay. Wow. Those kinds of, the rules were there to be help organize and they're important, but our institutions are here to serve and to be of service the best we can in the spirit of Catherine McCauley and the spirit of mercy. So. Some of those stories are just um, wonderful, wonderful. Changing just a little now. Was there a topic I was addressing? <laughs> no, you were fine. Uh, what did you study when you were going through your training? Um, you mean as like in the community or not or academic? You mean like my professional? Your prof your I've been All in school it. a lot. I tease about that. I'm overeducated and underqualified to do most things. <laughs> what, what are your degrees in? Okay. What, what did you I have a bachelor's in psychology and sociology from the University of Michigan. I have a master's of social work from Catholic University in Washington, D.C. Uh, in between time, I was working in Benton Harbor, Michigan, and I did social work kinds of things. And um, I love working with the population of folks who are on the street, who are alcoholic, chemically dependent. Really, in a sense, I, I never thought about it this way, but the way the, the group that many people are very afraid of, or, you know, but, not, but the people that would, you know, wash your, wash your windows with their arms and things, I would just start talking to them. I've always had that kind of inkling. And so uh, I went out, but I felt like I, I reached a, a wall, you know, uh, and so then I went for more education. I went to social work. Um, in my master's at Catholic U, and then um, met, majored in mental health because of the concerns of folks on the street, my concern for them on the street. And then, um, but that didn't end up evolving. I ended up working, was hired um, at St. Luke Institute for, um, it's a treatment program, inpatient, outpatient treatment program for priests and religious who are chemically dependent or alcoholic or drug, and also for the men, mostly the men, uh, many people, men who were pe priests who were pedophile. So I, I did that work. And then um, I'm, I was in the middle of working in, with this group when I was making final vows and I knew I needed to start relating to priests and religious as peers, not bundles of fear and, and pathology, you know. So I, I uh, you know, was at a Super Bowl party, where else do you make connections? And um, up in Baltimore, and uh, there was a brother there um, who was working as outpatient therapist for Johns Hopkins, and it was working with folks who were very mentally ill. So I said, there it is, there's the vision I've had, which is to work out of a strong mental health base, but working with folks who are really on the outs. And so um, I was hired, and, um, and then no sooner uh, had I been hired that I was asked to lead, um, take the lead on uh, Healthcare for the Homeless Clinic in Baltimore, which was a collaborative with Mercy Hospital there and Catholic Charities and Lutheran Social Services and Johns Hopkins. So um, I was the coordinator for the mental health part of that world. So 
Um, and then while I was there, again, I was running into walls. So I took advantage of an opportunity at the University of Maryland to get a postmaster certificate in administration. So I was able to learn more about finances and planning and strategic planning and things like that. Okay, then I, um, um, you want education. So it's hard to do that because it's all related to what it is I've been doing. So you That's don't mind? Fine. No, we don't mind. This is very unusual. This is, do I pay you for this therapy? <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay, I um, so I was working in healthcare for the homeless, and I I was struggling with my vocation. So I um, I was connected with the Mercies in Baltimore, which we have many, and it was a very good experience. But um, I was struggling, and so I went on what they call ex claustration, which is a Latin term for outside the cloister, really, but. Since we weren't in a cloister, we kind of considered it like a leave of absence or a trial separation in marriage. I was able to, you know, try to make that understandable. So, within that context, um, th that was a very, very hard decision. Very hard decision, but I just knew. Now you'd already taken your vows. I had. Oh yes, I had made final okay. vows. Okay. Um, but not much before that. I had taken final vows in '81, and this was '85. So. Um, I was one of those statistics, you know, <laughs> and I hated that because I had to be special, you know, but I was one of those statistics, and so I was, I really struggled, I honestly struggled, I, but I had a ritual of taking off my profession ring and with my spiritual director, and I put it on my shelf in my bedroom and knew I needed to just see what it was like for me to be an adult professional doing ministry but not being a sister. And uh, I did it for two years because I knew that one year would be all just getting adjusted and the second year I didn't want to have this decision lingering. I needed to have some kind of a date. So I um, did it for two years and um, I dated and I bought my car and I traveled and I did what I could and I overdrew my bank account. You know, all those things that you do when you're about 21. but. And I didn't have that, I didn't take that chance, that opportunity. I probably, in retrospect, I probably should have entered later. I should have had a more experience under my belt, but it's not what happened, so. But I really started missing an awful lot. And I remember very clearly um, an experience of, um, it was, a, it was a, a Saturday morning, a Sunday morning, I remember, and, um, I was sitting, I sat in a different chair in my apartment. I was out in D.C., I was reading the New York Times, I mean the Washington Post, having my coffee, just feeling like I've arrived, I've made it, you know, I mean really, the things I wanted, I had a really nice date the night before, and um, you know, and but I sat in a different chair. I remember that, it was so significant, and so when I get really stuck in something, I try to get to a different chair, or just see things differently. I sat in a different chair than I usually did. And I remember reading the paper with my coffee in my hand and, and looking around going, this is, this is good. I can make it. I can make it and be happy and be about mission, be about God still, you know. And then I heard, I'll never forget. And so now what? From within me. And I knew at that point that that meant I probably was going to return to the community. I just needed something more. And, but I didn't tell anybody any of this. This was just kind of like the secret. I don't know if, um, I, I, at that point in the 80s, there were a lot of, people could buy real, real fine gold chains and things. They were very popular. And I remember like that was a big thing. I, the first thing, I, first thing after I bought my car was buy a gold ring, nugget ring. I remember that. And, um, you know, a gold chain. Just simple. Um, and I realized that I didn't want to tell anybody about that little whisper in my hear, ear because it would be like playing with the chain too much. I just wanted to let it go. I just wanted to like let it go. I didn't want to play with it. I didn't want to mess with it. Just to see if what happens with it. Protect it and yet live with it. And so um, I had, um, I didn't tell anybody. I mean, and then it was um, 
Christmas Eve Mass. I remember my, I was living out in D.C. and my sister and her family lived over here uh, well, in Salem Township at the time, and she always loved small little country churches. So um, we, the, I joined their family for, East, for Christmas Mass. And my, my mom and dad and everybody was there. But, and I remember the first line of the homily was just something about Jesus. God loves us so much. And with that I checked out in my head. And I heard so clearly, it's time, you're ready, you're ready. And I knew exactly what that meant. And uh, I didn't tell anybody that, but I knew I was going to return to the community. And I told the community the first time, um, you know, when there was a New Year's Eve party, and I brought a bottle of Blue Nun to <laughs> <laughs> say I'm coming back. <laughs> and, um, um, and then, you know, what was wonderful, too, was this is just a little part of the romance and growing up kind of thing, was there was a psychiatrist I had dated shortly after I left, and um, we had a nice time and stuff, but then he stopped calling, and, you know, the trauma. Um, and, uh, and I was working off campus at Hopkins, so I didn't have any natural ways of seeing him. And um, do you believe, I was, that was New Year's Eve, I, I, my, my paperwork, my exclustration expired, was to expire in, um, I believe, March. So we were just going to let that expire. I connect, connected with the community, I told them, this, you know, so we would just let that expire, we didn't have to revoke it or anything. And I planned a liturgy, uh, my spiritual director was a priest, so he was going to come to my apartment and I had a bunch of nuns come and I put my ring back on, that was all the plan. And, um, and it was lovely, it was lovely. But you know, about three weeks before my little ceremony, my return, I got a call from the psychiatrist. Rita, what's up? Well, how are you, you know? I said, where have you been, you know, and that kind of thing. And um, it felt like it was a wonderful way to wrap the to wrap up the circle, you know, mm -hmm. and he said, oh, come on, you've got three more. You mean you, basically, when I told him I was returning to, the, he, returning to the community, he basically, I know, he said, so you're saying you can live without a man in your life. And I said, you know, really? I, I wanted to say, no, I can clearly live without you in my life. I don't know <laughs> what the future's going to hold, but clearly <laughs> you're not going to be part of it. But, you know, he said, come on, I've got, let's go to St. Michael's Island, which is in the middle of the uh, Chesapeake Bay, and it's, it's, it's a knockdown from M Mackinac Island, but, you know, it's that kind of slower pace. And he says, you've got three weeks, come on. Before you and I said no. I said this, you know, it's about integrity and it's about my decisions made. That was such a wonderful gift. I don't know if you would understand. I mean, it was like this wraparound thing. Like I got closure, and it, and the reason why he stopped calling is that I was too hot and heavy for him. And he said I got scared, and I said, well, I hear you. I was pretty hot and heavy. It'd been a long time. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you had any idea how long, no, he did know. He knew I was a nun because he, he he had like blinked his eyes more than once trying to figure out what did what was a nun doing working at Hopkins. So um, that was a lovely story. So anyways, when I returned to the community and I continued on the ministry at um, Healthcare for the Homeless, but I was really realizing how much I needed and wanted some input regarding theology and faith. I knew what I believed, but I didn't know why or what difference it made or where did it come from, you know. Um, and so um, I looked around and um, I ended up going to Washington Theological Union for a master's in theology. And that's when I wrote a thesis on Catherine Macaulay on her ecclesiology. And so um, with that then I did vocation work for the community and then afterwards uh, I moved back here and did vocation work for seven years. Well then, do you want to keep hearing this? Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. Really? At, at some point, though, we yeah, want to... Would you to like to direct me a little bit? That's right. <laughs> well, at I some point, we want to know what your role at Mercy College Oh, yes, was. okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, when did you end up there? Okay, well, I, when I was doing vocation work, I felt a need to be still doing the social work thing, and I couldn't do it much with vocation work. But um, 
So uh, I was living with Sister Linda Worthman at the time, and uh, Dr. Van Camp, Aloha Van Camp was just being hired in, and um, I did. I taught adjunct at Mercy. Okay. So I taught in the evenings because I could schedule myself around that I'd be there on Tuesday nights. I loved it. I loved the teaching of these adult students. I loved, we just had a, a very good experience, very good time. So I only taught for like three years adjunct because then my, my, my territory expanded in terms of my vocation work and I could never guarantee where I would be on any given day because I had Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky then. And that's how I got, I got down to Kentucky was through vocation work. Um, so the Mercy College, um, that was about my only role, except for before I entered, I was looking for a job and I was going to Michigan, but Dearborn, but um, I, um, through somebody, got me, let me know that the food service at Mercy College was <laughs> hiring servers and it worked great for students because, so I did that. I, I didn't go to Mercy College, but I worked it. So I would serve the meals to the president and things like that. Yeah. Would you have a favorite story or a favorite memory of your time there at Mercy College? Well, I can tell you because my s Mercy College has been part of the periphery of my existence with my sister having entered back in 61 she entered there at Mercy College mm -hmm. and so I remember as a child you know, running around where the grotto was, and going on a little rowboat. Uh, on the, they had a little rowboat on a little pond by the grotto. I remember getting hit by in the hit by a ba um, softball. <laughs> I've had time visitation Sunday because really you try to find something to do. <laughs> and so um, I remember um, locking all the toilet stalls. <laughs> on the inside, <laughs> crawling under. So those are some of my memories. So I remember loving the. the <laughs> I remember loving the marble toilet stalls. They were, I just loved all that marble. <laughs> and then they would have alcoves for statues, and so we would go up and climb in there and pretend we were statues, you know, as if they couldn't tell that we weren't statues. <laughs> Now, some of my students did that in <laughs> when I was teaching adjunct, but um, I, 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 loved, I loved the campus. I loved, um, I really enjoyed the students. I loved that we really reached out to adult students and the social work program particularly. Um, you know, social work is not necessarily a degree that a person goes into immediately as, you know, at 18, oh good, I want to be a social worker. Um, you know, at first I wanted to be a lawyer and I wanted to be a sociologist, you know, and it was only as I grew that I realized I wanted to apply some of that information. So the fact that um, th we had adult students, and that's oftentimes across small Catholic colleges throughout the United States, when you have a social work program, you tend to attract more older returning. people, returning students who are there because they want to be. Right, but a lot of them have raised their family yes. and they look around and they want to do something good now. Yes. And social work seems to fill that for and them. I, Yes, and I used to love watching their eyes like when we would be teaching about developmental um, development, human development. And you know, like when a three-year-old is stopped by a leaf and just looks at the leaf and just, you know, doesn't matter that you're rushing, it doesn't matter that the right. mom is late. Mm -hmm. And you know to see the the mother the the student's eyes widen like that's why she does that all the time. Like, she's curious, looking, noticing things outside of just you, and you know, and so I love seeing that where they can apply their learned, their lived experience with learning. So those are some of my favorite. Um, I remember when uh, the Winans used to sing at the you now very very famous African American gospel singing, yes. um, uh, you know, C.C. Winans, and very famous. Uh, I remember going to hear them um, at the auditorium at Mercy College. Um, uh, I just think they were, Mercy College I think was quietly avant-garde without, it was kind of like the spirit of mercy, you know, we just kind of did things, um, whether it was mainstream or not, but if it felt like it made sense to 
as a Sister of Mercy yes. during that period, yes. <coughs> what impact do you feel that your work had on the students who were going there? Well, I was definitely, you know, among the, uh, the, uh, the youngest teacher there as a sister. Um, we, had, we had quite a few sisters there when I was teaching adjunct there. But uh, I was definitely younger, and um, I've worked on the streets, so my, my experience is different. And the students, I think, really loved that combination that I, and I would say in my class, I, we would, I would allow for a space for faith. Didn't mean that we were going to be talking about religion. But for people's sense of meaning, and in the 80s you didn't do that. 90s you didn't talk that much about faith yet. Now you, it's, people see spirituality as an important part of just breathing. But um, then I think I was able to help students claim their own spirituality, and, but also look at it to see how does it impact their care of others. So if it oppresses or, you know, you need to look at that, um, whatever your spirituality is. But it was a space for faith of searching for meaning. And I think that we had an awful lot of fun in the classroom. And I tried to tap, you know, the knowledge base of these people before me that um, knew far more than I did about many things. I just tried to help them organize it into a social work construct. Um, so I think that it was a good experience for them of saying, she's a nun, she's a nun, she's a cool nun. She's the fun nun. I've had all kinds of names. I'm sure I've had others, but those are the ones that they tell me. And I remember once, I was sitting out during the break, and I was out, uh, this was over by Marion Hall, and I was just sitting at the picnic table having, I used to tease that, you know, if you want to get on my good side, you get me a Diet Burners, and I'm very happy when I grade papers with the Diet Burners. <laughs> We bring me cases of, <laughs> but I remember sitting out there just taking a break, and there were some smokers, and um, somebody came up and said, "Oh man, I really blew that algebra. Really blew that math thing. Really blew that." And one of the other students said, "Who had no idea who I was? You've got to go see Sister Bridget. She will not let you fail. She just will not let you fail. And it's not because she's going to scare you. She's going to just walk with you, and she has so much patience." You, you just go see Sister Bridget. She'll help you. You get that class next semester with Sister Bridget. She'll, she'll get, she'll, you'll get it. Not only will she help you, you'll get it. You'll understand what it means. And I had such pride on so many levels. I mean, I never told the, that those people that I was, and oh, somebody else came out then and said, Sister Rita, is it time to, you know, do I have time to go have, you know, and so this other student like looked at me and I just said, hopefully, thank you. You know, I'm so proud of the Mercy Presence and that if we have any legacy like that of the Sister Bridget's, you know, who's just not going to let somebody fail because they don't get it. If you don't work, it's different, but right. yeah, but right. so um, I don't know what my legacy is because now what I'm doing here on campus is... Um, I've been in higher ed. I got my doctorate in Louisville and um, was teaching at a small Catholic university, un not unlike what Mercy College was. And I, be I was chair of the School of Social Work. We had a master's and bachelor's program in social work. And um, uh, circumstances happened, so I ended up leaving there. It was all very positive, but I went on sabbatical. And then when I left my sabbatical, when I was halfway through my sabbatical, I thought, wow, wow. I can breathe. It's just amazing what you can do when you have a little extra time, a little less pressure. So um, with that, I started on my sabbatical, I visited many of our sisters in Central and South America and some, among some of the very poor ministries here, in, I mean the ministries that are very poor in the States. And I realized some, some basic things they needed that they could never afford. One was that a web, a web designer, you know, webmaster and grant writer and also some um, you know, it's one thing to have a consultant come in and say, you know, you need to really have this report on this, and this is what you need, and this is what, but nobody has time to do those things. So I, I like writing reports now. I do the SAC stuff very well, or whatever it is, the accreditation, um, writing self-studies, things like that. I enjoy doing that. 
when I have time, I do it. I do. And so I've been doing that for the university, with, particularly with so social work and the Eastside program. So I've been... Um, when you say university, you mean... UDM. UDM. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I, you know, am up in uh, social work office quite a bit with Dr. Van Camp, with Lola Van Camp. But um, also, um, I'm mostly on that Eastside program over by the university center across from Eastland. Um, where social work is really booming there with, with numbers of women, of returning students. It's very much like the Mercy College population of women, returning students, working moms, um, and I love it. But I'm helping to orchestrate that and get accreditation through our accrediting body of social work and stuff. So that's, this is where that's primarily where I'm working and I have the, I think I, equivalent of half time you know, adjunct salaries. I'm not, I'm not uh, fully funded. <laughs> but, uh, and then, you know, like I'm pulling together the Spirit Mass for Spirit. So celebrate yes, Spirit? Yeah, Celebrate Spirit. So I'm, the more I'm around, the more I think um, people, I'm enjoying being connected in a lot of different ways. And so anytime, I'm, I'm always, I, I'm very, I always used to say to my students and I say to everybody else, you know my name, I'm, my name is my sister Rita Valade. I'm a sister of mercy. Very happy to be a sister of mercy. Chose to rechose to be a sister of mercy, and you can call me anything you want as long as I know you know it's respectful. So, how do you, how do you live out the mission of the Sisters of Mercy today? You've been telling us, but um, how do you live it? All I can say is, how do I try to live it? Because um, I know I fall short. So sometimes it's easier to have somebody else tell you what you do versus what you yourself. Um, I, I try to be very prayerful. I try to rely on God of mercy who just rocks. I mean, who just is always giving everybody a second chance, if not a hundredth chance, and who just doesn't hold grudges. So I try to be like that. Um, I try to be alert to what gifts I have and how they can intersect with the world's great hungers and the great needs. So. Um, so I work out of my basement. It feels like sometimes I'm, um, sometimes I feel like what I'm doing is so unimportant. And then I have to think, well, you know, it's not unimportant to those women sitting in the seats in the East Side program to have an accredited part program. Um, it's not unimportant to Aloha that I, or, or to um, um, Dr. Garibaldi that we have, or Pam, uh, that we have with social work or sociology as well, um, our mission is articulated well, or that we can present well to really reflect what it is that we are about. It's not unimportant, it just feels at times like oh, anybody can do this. So I just try to always be in the website stuff and the grant writing I, at this point, and it might, I might be evolving into another position somewhere. I don't know, but I, I want to always be as faithful as I can be to how the community, how God, how creation wants to use my gifts and my yearnings. I have no greater yearning than, no greater yearning than complete envelopment in God. So how I live that out is through the mission of mercy. And um, it's been a wonderful, it's been a wonderful experience of being, we don't talk, you know, like in local community, we don't talk about God or our faith journeys all the time. But the point is, it is expected that we all are on one. Yes. It is the norm that we are. There is support for whatever way our journeys seem to lead us. 
we see each other as consultants and help supporters and co-discerners, so we don't see authority as you, you go there, you go there. But, you know, like I have had a dance for years with Mercy College of Detroit in terms of hiring. I have, I have, I applied for a full-time position in the social work. That didn't work out. When I was free then, another time, they had just hired when I was, uh, when they were uh, open, I just had started a new position, like at Hopkins and stuff. So we've had a dance the entire many years. I was very open to coming here, to coming to the university. Um, and it's just, but you know, gone, long gone are the days where sisters have preference. I mean, I don't think that we, we get preferential treatment. I'm sure we do. I'm sure we do. And that sounds very much like a privileged position where a white person would say, well, I'm not privileged. You know, I get the same privileges that an African-American person does, and that's just not true. You get a lot of respect. Well, I hope. But I do. I feel it. I feel it. I feel, I feel like we have, I have a lot of respect. I'm also on the board of Mercy Higher Ed, Conference of Mercy Higher Ed, um, which oversight, oversees the 17 colleges and universities that Sisters of Mercy sponsor. So UDM is one of them, um, co-sponsor. And um, I think that's another way of using those gifts, of, of seeing the bigger picture. Now you do know Barbara Milbauer. I do. I do. I <laughs> do. With your grantsmanship. Yes. I was yes. Thinking, wow. Yes. That's I, a good I, place that, for you. that actually ran through my head, but I think that would not be. Uh, Barbara and I talked about a position a couple of years ago when I moved back up here from Louisville, um, but it did feel like it was the right fit. So we, I didn't pursue it, and she didn't either. So it was out of that office, though. Would be. Uh, a fundraiser or a development person for one of the local colleges, one of the college, whatever we call it here, college of schools. Yeah. Yeah. We have both. Okay. Well, it's something like school that. School of social. Something work. like that. But it was, and it was, a, it was a discipline I didn't know anything about, so yeah. that's why the fit didn't work. Um, we're kind of going off script here a little bit. Um, this wasn't part of our original interview questions, but... Um, Given the recent passing of Sister Kenise, uh, you did know her. Yes, I did. I okay. loved with her. We're wondering if you have a favorite story or memory of her that you would like to share. So you uh, you lived with her I lived recently? No, in Washington D.C. So yes, we lived together in D.C. Do you have a favorite story, favorite memory you can share with us? <laughs> this is totally inconsequential. Totally. Do you mind inconsequential? No. We want to hear about her. She, she was a night owl, and she would stay up really late. I mean, she would be working on a project, and I identify with that. I was up till four this morning working on a variety of things oh, uh, that I had failed to get to before this. And so and that would be Kanish. She would be thinking through. She was doing a, a facilitation then, full time job as facilitator for religious communities and organizations and things. But she would get up at seven in the morning, pray with us, and always had her breakfast. And 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 she said, oh, or even like on a Saturday morning, she'd get up and have her breakfast and then go back to bed. She always had a, and I, I thought that was so odd. I grew up, you know, when you sleep until you wake up, and but she always was very <laughs> regular about that little bowl of cereal. <laughs> That's very inconsequential, but that just gave a little flavor of, you know, a little thing. She, um, she was, she was a very creative person. In some respects, an artist, but not, uh, not artiste. You know what I mean? I, mm -hmm. I've lived with sisters who are artists, and they're just some of them are just different from me. Like, really, you think that way? Really? But they have to to think outside the box in order to be the artists that they are. She was, uh, I think, uh, an artist of seeing possibilities and how to make some of those possibilities become real. And I would be stunned. I, 
was chair of, uh, of a ministry fund and um, uh, that would give money to ministries and her she would always be counted on to have some applications for student mentors or I mean she just thought outside the box with these little, with these pro and then co the the whole mercy education project I remember so clearly those years of how to help it was it was it was an attempt she kind of helped spearhead it, but within the community of saying, all right, we're no longer in schools in the traditional way. We no longer have people, sisters who are interested necessarily in working in, in elementary schools, teaching there. But we have such a richness of expertise and a passion for education of young people. What can we help with this? And so she, and they, the community, but she was very instrumental in help to gather people to come up with this new design called Mercy Education Project. Um, are you familiar with that program? We've heard of it. Okay. Some of the other interviewee, <coughs> excuse me, interviewees have mentioned it. Yes. But I'm not mm, sure exactly what it all entails. Well, it's about 25 years old now, and it grew out of the vision of some, to do something innovative. Um, in education for women and girls, particularly girls at that point. For the girls that have, were kind of dropped out of schools and just not making it, not, and how to do more than an after school program, um, find out what the needs were. And so they started with the girls program and it was down um, over in Corktown area. I've forgotten the name of the school, it's now closed, but they used to have a third floor wing and the girls would come up and they had well over the course of time I lost track of it because I moved on to other ministries in different cities but this Mercy Education Project has grown and really in response to the women do we need to be winding up okay it's fine sorry um, so she um, she helped she helped build this from an infant kind of infancy, I, infant idea of somehow addressing educational needs of girls in the city, to this program now that's 24 year, 25 years old, who, um, uh, and then she moved on. You know, she didn't. She st got it stabilized, got funding, and she moved on. And um, not so sure that she felt like her ongoing gift was ongoing administration. You know, um, and then because of her experience, uh, she went to teach. She had her doc. She has her doctorate. In, she had her doctorate in some kind of for me obscure linguistics. And um, but she just had this drive for more knowledge and more. And she so and such a great commitment to sit to the city and such a great commitment to education. So she you know, was working at Dominican High, or, or Eastside Catholic, East Catholic, and uh, when they closed that, she, again, just what I was saying, and as I started with the Mercy tradition, I mean, she started rallying and finding out if there was funding and investigating Crystal Ray models, and want, so committed, wanted so badly to have Catholic education, secondary ed, that also would include girls, in the city, because the Jesuits had a very, very, very fine two places here, but there was nothing for girls with, um, and so Crystal Ray was never designed initially for a girls' school. But she, um, I remember, um, her definitely going, you know, really challenging the archdiocese. They didn't want this. They didn't want. They didn't want to put any energy or money into Catholic. They just kind of wrote off the the city in terms of Catholic um, secondary ed. She really. I mean, they like they were blatantly against her, and she just kept in her very gentle way and uh, articulate way. You said this last week, I just want to see if you're still thinking that. Okay, all right, so now let's, 
you know, in your face, but you don't know that you, you were just in your face too, you know. <laughs> um, and she uh, just had a really strong ability, and she got Skillman money for this, oh, who were wow. supportive. And then that started, oh, the diocese started waking up, like, oh yeah, so now the diocese is seen as big supporters. I mean, they don't give a penny, but, you know, supporters. Because they had to have the archdiocesan approval, of course. We are one church. And and even though this church gets us crazy, makes us all crazy, it is the, it's a, it's a path that um, has led us to God and helped reveal God to us. And so it's we are Catholic. Sisters of Mercy are Catholic, and we support Catholic. And um, uh, so she, uh, anyways, it was because of her that, that we have a crystal ray that is flourishing. In our last few minutes, um, as sort of a wrap up, is there anything you'd like to tell us that we haven't asked or we haven't talked about yet? Um, a yes and no. I, I, I don't have anything more unless you have something else to have. It's been a privilege to do this. Um, I'm so glad I was moved by the Spirit to like get a crisp blouse on things, <laughs> you know. I mean, I wasn't sure what I was walking into, so this was really great. And I'm sure you this told me. This has been very interesting. I love, we've heard a lot about Kenise with the waterboard and stuff uh -huh. like that, so I love that story about just her every day. Yes, yeah, yes. That was great. Yes. Good, good. Well, about you. your whole life's journey. It's been really fascinating. Well, well thank you. Know, you. I thank love you. hearing these stories because I'm, I'm just telling, um, I'm just telling them I'm reading the book that about the history of Mercy College. Uh, Mercy Higher Ed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Um, oh, Lucille so Milton? Uh, no, no, it's uh, Justine's it's sister, Sabrin. Justine uh, Sabrin. Yes. Justin Sabrin. And it's and I'm only up to like she goes year by year. Yes. So I'm only up to like 1950s, but it, and I was telling them it's every time that the sisters want to do something, they're stopped. Mm -hmm. They're put you know roadblock is put in their way, and the next thing you know. The next chapter, the uh, the next year, they're working their way. Uh huh. Uh, you know, uh -huh. it's just it's yes. It's been so that's really lovely. And that's why I love that story you just told about Sister Canise with the with the high school because that's the the whole book so far has yeah. been that kind of thing that but there's a war the there's a way you saying you just no, and then the it. next thing you know, the sisters are getting exactly what they want. They just bided their time and they did things a different way and And I really and it do started. believe it become because it comes so profoundly out of a collective experience of God. So it's not wasn't about Kines having a school called Saint Kines. Her name is nowhere anywhere in the building. I mentioned her name to some of the staff when I've gone down there to help out with their database. They don't know who she is. Um, it's not about her. I mean, the administration does, but it's no, about no. The, the mission. It's about the mission. 